just to give you some background, I remember getting off the plane at Heathrow and uh, my host had actually asked for a taxi driver to take me to place A, right? Now, that was where I was staying the night. I didn't mind that. But um, Aussies, well, the normal Aussie does not sit in the back seat in a taxi. He just hops in the front. Um, now, that apparently is pretty <laughs> unusual over there. So the, the driver and I got chatting. And there's no doubt about it. He was a Muslim. But the interesting thing was because of my need to do international type research, because of my need to sort of cross many cultures in many countries, whether I'm going to India or America or, or Hawaii or climbing mountains or whatever, I've had to become fairly familiar with local culture. Otherwise, you can step on some big toes uh, really, really fast. So I already had done a lot about Islam. I'd interacted with Islamic students at universities and in some of the presentations. And normally, if you're dealing with creation, they are very, very supportive, right? I got no problem with their support at all. Very enthusiastic, lots of questions until you get on to the authority of the Bible and where that comes from. But anyway, back to our taxi driver. It was very evident that he knew very little about the Quran. He believed what the, the imam told him. He believed what his local teachers had told him at the Islamic type colleges or schools there, but he didn't know much about the actual Quran. And as we talked, it was very evident that I, the non-Islamic, knew a fair bit more about Islam than he did. And yes, I've got four copies of the Quran in my uh, library storage here. I've read quite a bit of the Quran and in English, by the way, because like the, Quran, the, the driver, I don't read uh, Arabic at all. But they do have some recommended ones. If you're out there, get the New York edition of the Quran designed for those people who don't read uh, Arabic. It's a very useful one. Um, OK, now getting on a bit further. Next interaction. And particularly this has happened either in England or in Canada, where there are big Islamic concentrations of people. Of course, if you go to India, yes, you'll find them very, very commonly spread depending on which part of the country you actually go to. But here's what happened next on my trip in England. Okay, I stayed with a family and their daughter-in-law was a teacher. Now, as she was sharing with me, she had lots of Islamic students in her classes and the boys particularly were very aggressive to the point of saying, when we take over, you will be out. Because you may have noticed that very strongly convinced Islamic men don't have much room for women in positions of authority over them. Uh, and this girl wanted to know what should she do because she was not being supported by hierarchies of people saying, okay, you boys stop this or you're out. There was a real fear of the power of Islam even in London. All right, now next step. I was asked to do a debate against a Muslim imam. Now, I, I'll be honest, I have had to do a lot of preparation to debate what I thought would be a very scholarly, because to be an imam, you have to be appointed a leader, you have to be a well-trained college graduate, uh, particularly from one of their colleges. So I, I, I'd never done this before. <laughs> I thought, well, John Mackay is not bad at debating. Uh, John Mackay's okay on science and all of that. How about Quranic stuff? How about the verses associated with uh, Muhammad uh, or the various versions of his name that you'll come across? Not so good. So I spent months preparing this debate, reading up my Qurans. And the interesting thing was I hardly needed any of it at all. Yes, he firmly believed Islam uh, was all about the true God. Islam was all about the true creator. It's, he firmly believed all of that. I didn't need to convince him anything to do with what was wrong with evolution. But when it got to actually establishing uh, Islam was written recordings of what Muhammad had did, no argument at all. I mean, he didn't have an argument to defend that. He kept repeating one thing, that the Quran is so beautifully written, it must be from a holy deity, a singularity, uh, that actually conveyed this through Muhammad across to the um, to the paper that it was written on. 
Now, what was interesting, of course, was I had one simple retort. I said, but all the records tell us Muhammad couldn't write. Now, that debate didn't go all that well for the Islamic scholar, but he handed out books so beautiful, available to everybody. I mean, everyone went away with something like 30 or 40 pounds worth of magnificent publications. And I saw my oil money, my petrol money being used to spread Islam. Interesting. Okay, third bit of information. Um, I've had students come up to me and threaten me with death. Yes, you see the penalty for death if you don't believe in Allah, if you oppose Allah through the Trinity, the triunity that Jesus Christ is one of three, then the penalty is death. Now, I must admit, I've only been threatened with death a couple of times. Uh, the other was from an evolutionist who basically put it in print. I've still got it. He wrote and he said, if you dare come to our town and preach this nonsense about creation and Christ the creator, you will be killed. Now, I don't know about you, but us Aussies don't tend to take too much notice of those sort of uh, actual threats. So I went there anyway. Yes, I'm looking at myself in the screen here trying to adjust my clothes after changing my vest off. Uh, and nothing actually happened at all. But the anger from that man was incredible. Atheists wanted to kill me. This very keen, enthusiastic, angry Muslim student wanted to kill me. Okay, now going two steps further before we get onto our PowerPoints. Um, you will notice I'm going to use the King James Bible. Now, I became a Christian through in the King James Bible. No apologies for using it at all. But the one thing you get to find out about Islamics is they have a very high reverence for that which is traditional. So they would prefer you to use a traditional, an English version that was there when they first sort of uh, turned up in England or was used by the missionaries. King James scores miles ahead of everything else, even though many of the English people can't understand the English that's in there anymore. So that's what I'll be using. Secondly, you'll find that I'll be using the name Jehovah uh, rather than Yahweh, which has become the more popular way. Now, a little bit of history for those of you. We already did a session, I'm sure it's available, on the role of J in the English language. Didn't really come into prominence till the end of the 1500s, became massively prominent after the 1600s. Hence, you will read Jehovah uh, in, in many Christian publications rather than the Coverdale Bible, an early English translation, which used Yehovah, right? Uh, an I rather than a J. And of course, the I and the Y are pretty similar. So don't be surprised that the tetragrammaton, the four letters that the Jews started to use instead of pronouncing God's name, don't have a defined uh, sound, but you could go from English, Yehovah, right? Yahweh, or you can go from King James, Jehovah. Now, Jehovah is the commonest one at the moment, and some of you know that we've made up many songs like Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Well, if you sing it as Jehovah Jireh, it doesn't quite actually match the same. There's my topic, Islam, Creator, and Christ. We will come across the Trinity. We will discuss issues like how did Allah get to be the all-powerful God? And I'm going to do it in a couple of bites. This one first, I'll do one bite, then we'll hand over to Craig on the history of Allah as a God or as a believed God. Take your pick, okay? There's what you come across. Craig will deal more with this. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is. Can you finish it off? Most people in the West can finish it off because you hear it so often these days. 200 years ago, the average European wouldn't have known the answer to that except through reading history or what the soldiers had reported back when they got back from the wilds of the British Empire. There is no God but Allah. Oh, there is Surah, chapter 5, verse 73. Surah is like a chapter, right? Uh, each of these is an individual revelation um, to Muhammad is the claim, and there is no Allah except one Allah. Now, you see the word, or oh, oh, you said in English, there is no God except one God, Allah. Okay, Allah and Allah are basically the same word. And if you look up your Bible, you will find Allah is the word used by King Nebuchadnezzar. 
he called Daniel's God, Allah. It's an old word and it means God. And now it's become a name and Craig's going to talk about that. Okay, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. Now, why would they call Muhammad his prophet? The answer is very simple. Um, Deuteronomy 18. Yes, Muhammad was familiar with excerpts out of the Old Testament. The Lord your God, Moses is talking. He's talking to the people of Israel. They've left Egypt. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. Now, let's be honest. I'm sure you would have been impressed by Moses. Even when he came down from the mount and his face was glowing because of the presence of God with him. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. One who's known God face to face. A prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Now, when you make the claim that your prophet, Muhammad, is the fulfillment of this prophet, you need to be very careful. Uh, the Lord your God will raise up a prophet for, like me from your midst, from your brethren. Context, Moses is talking to the people of Israel. Who are the people of Israel? They're the descendants of Isaac. And, and, and remember Abraham? Well, Abraham had another set of descendants. Uh, you remember Ishmael, which gave rise to the Arabic people? Now, Ishmael and all of his brothers from Abraham have been fighting from that day to this. The one thing you have to be careful of is that your brethren would not have to include Judah. Judah gave rise to the Jews, and they're fighting still with the Arabs. If your brothers do not include Ishmael, then you can't fulfill. Uh, I mean, if your brothers do not uh, include Judah, you can't be one of these one of these people like Muhammad claims to be. And it goes on one step further. And the Lord said to me, I'll raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command to him. He's going to be a leader. He's going to be a preacher. He's going to be a speaker. He's going to be the voice of God. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words we read in Deuteronomy chapter 18, which he speaks in my name, I will hold him accountable. I will hold him to task. I will require it of that person. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I've not commanded him to speak, or he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Now, in other words, if you claim to be this prophet, if you claim to be any prophet of the most high God of the people of Israel, in Deuteronomy, as Moses is delivering them out of Egypt, the whole of Israel is being brought out of Egypt. They're being given a prophecy about a future leader who will be like Moses. He'll be a descendant, therefore, of Abraham, but not via Ishmael. Now, do you realize the conflict we've got here? If this prophet is not from Abraham via all the people of Israel, then this prophet is a false prophet. Now, do you see, you Christians out there, what you're saying about Ishmael? Do you see what you're saying about the Mohammedan? You see what, that's not a very popular word, a common word these days. The, the people who are descendants and listening to um, uh, Muhammad. Okay, go one step further. Muhammad said, our God and your God is one, and it is to him he bows. Now, do you notice my little um, footnote there was aimed at the Christians and Jews of his day? You do really, really, really need to actually come to grips with the fact that some of the prophecies made, some of the statements made in the Quran, some of the claims that would be to you and I would read as present continuing tense. Muhammad got mad at the Jews and Christians of his day after this. Surah 29, uh, you will find that he was trying to do his best to get in favor with the Jews and with the Christians. Our God and your God is one. Now, there are many groups today within the sort of Christian cult level who say we're Christians. And reality, when you check them out, they're not. They're not actually obeying Christ. They're believing some of what Christ said. Well, Muhammad, our God and your God is one. And it's to him we bow. Now, if you want to run a test on this, uh, can I encourage you to actually check out a couple of things? When Jesus Christ actually was on this earth, when Paul is led by Christ through his spirit on the road to uh, Damascus, when Paul spends three years 
away with Jesus in the desert being taught. You could, you've got a way to find out if this is true or not. You see, Paul comes back and he writes Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. All things are made by Christ. All things are made for Christ. Question, run a test. Walk up the main street of Baghdad. Here's what you're going to shout. We believe God is the creator. Use the Middle Eastern words like some of the churches do. Some of the churches actually use the old word Allah for God. Now, if you were to walk up and down the main street of Baghdad shouting that, we believe Allah created everything. They'd pat you on the back. Now turn around and walk the other way. We believe Christ is the creator of all things. I'm sorry. At that point, you've just lost your friends. At that point, you become enemies of all of Islam. At that point, the penalty? Yes, just like that young Islamic man threatened to put me to death. That's the penalty in Baghdad for admitting and claiming that Christ is the creator. The Allah we bow to in Islam and the God of your Bible are the same being. I'm sorry for those of you who think that is the case if you are Christians, because there are many Christians in churches who say, bring them in. We've even seen some of the councils of churches bring the Muslims in because their God and our God are the same. No, you can run a test in Baghdad. And if you lose your head, you are serving a different God. The Allah we bow to in Islam and the God of your Bible are not the same being at all. If you want to know what Allah is like, you see, you need to come to grips with the fact, don't just go by common uh, you know, parlance out there. Go by what the Quran says. Now we're up to Surah 112. These are like your chapters and they also have verses. Say he is God alone, writes the Quran. God the eternal, he begets not and he is not begotten. Is your God and the God of the Bible alike? Well, Allah is one and he does not have a son. Now, can you see the difference? For those of you who stand in a university and do a debate against a Muslim, you have to actually say, well, here's what my God is like. He is father, he is son, etc. Jesus Christ is the same as God the Father. Oh, you want to check that? I know the others are dealing later on, but in John chapter 14, the chapter where I became a Christian, the thing that struck me out of that chapter is here is Jesus Christ. He's been born in Bethlehem. He grows up in Egypt. He's taken out of Egypt. He comes back. He takes his role as prophet about age 30. He becomes a priest. He becomes a king. And in John chapter 14, he's talking to First of all, his disciples, his believers. And he says, if you love me and you obey my commandments, I will make myself known to you. You can never know Allah. Jesus Christ claims, you can know me. I will make myself known to you. As I've told people many times, I became a Christian because of Jesus' promise that he could do something now, present content, continuing tense. I stayed a Christian because he did. I do know Jesus Christ. And so many Christians have been willing to die on that fact alone. But then when, when you have a look, Jesus says, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And uh, only through me can you come to the Father. And Thomas says, hey, show us the Father. And Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And all of a sudden, you start on a route that says, wow, this is deep. Uh, it is deep. There's no doubt about it. But Muhammad understood how deep it went and what the division was. And Diane, even though she's in darkness there on the screen, she'll touch on a couple of points later on. What's Allah like? There's the claims of the Quran. He's the creator of all things. Man was created from a clot of blood. Man was not made in Allah's image. Okay, keep those in mind. Allah is the creator of all things. If he's the creator of all things, could Jesus be the creator of all things? If man was made in the image of God, then was he made in Allah's image? Or is he being restored to the likeness of Christ because it was Christ who was the creator and Christ made him in his image? Okay, just a couple of other things here before I hand over to Craig. From the beginning, what has Allah been like? Oops, he's the creator. Oops, we just said that there. Let's make sure we don't get that double up. Muslims upset Jesus Christ as a human prophet but never as God. They never accept him as the son of God. If your testimony is, I became a Christian and I know Jesus Christ as God the son, 
or as the creator well i'm sorry but the muslims are going to have to disagree with you and if you insist on the point you'll either be taxed to death or you'll be put to death yes there is a religious tax over there that allows you to stay a christian provided you fit into their political system but does not accept that anything you say is correct